Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today's episode is about releasing those negative emotions and those resentments that stop you from achieving those miracles you want in your life. It's about forgiving yourself and letting go of the past. The goal of this podcast has always been to allow for you to create miracles in your life, to choose and create your own reality. There are many aspects to this, and one of the important ones is how to deal with obstacles and negative emotions that might come up in your life. We've discussed this many times in the past. For instance, we've discussed the advantage method, which helps you to assume that any bad thing that happens to you is to your advantage. I wanted to go into this a little bit further and deeper, because many of you are dealing with negative emotions and obstacles, and it can seem hopeless. And if we can understand that they are not obstacles, that they are stepping stones, it will change the way you think. By now, you probably have a pretty good idea of how the hidden laws of the universe work with respect to co-creation and miracles. As we have discussed throughout this podcast, there is an infinite intelligence, an absolute power, and an unconditional love that is the essence of everything. Whether you call it spirit or God, source or higher power, really doesn't matter. We direct it and it provides. This intelligence, power, and love respond to our consciousness, to the sum total of all our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Since we have many differing thoughts and opinions and even conflicting emotions on a number of things, spirit responds to those thoughts and feelings that are the most dominant or powerful in our consciousness. Nothing is lost in consciousness, but there are some very powerful thoughts, feelings, and emotions about ourselves and our lives that we often internalize. They remain just below the level of our conscious mind, surfacing briefly with regularity. We tend to absorb them as part of our being as we continue through life. When these thoughts and emotions are positive, for example, self-confidence or high self-esteem, feeling secure, they support us in everything we do. They are powerful attractors of good into our world. However, negative emotions and thought patterns create fields of negativity. They also are strong attractors of negative experiences. I believe the deepest and most powerful of these negative emotions are guilt, or when internalized, shame, regret, and resentment. Some people might wonder why anger is not included in this episode when we discuss negative emotions. That's because anger falls into one of two basic categories healthy anger, and unhealthy anger. Healthy anger is usually a positive in our lives. It is a feeling that arises when an important need is not met or when we have been intruded upon or violated in some way. Healthy anger can also be a resolve to do better, to lose weight, for example. Essentially, healthy anger makes us take action to protect ourselves or to change some situation in our lives once we take action, the anger dissipates and the experience is productive. I used to think that all anger was bad. Then I realized in many of the things I've done in the past, I've been motivated by an anger to improve. Unhealthy anger, however, is almost always counterproductive. It is a negative emotion that can range from brief angry outbursts to violent loss of self-control. There's often a sense of injury and a desire for vindication or retribution. This type of anger is indeed negative, but it is not a primary emotion. It is a secondary emotion that stems from a primary emotion, often guilt or resentment. It usually originates from a very early childhood injury or injuries and becomes frozen, a chronic feeling that becomes a habitual way of responding to anything that is frustrating or is not the way we want it to be. The key here is to work with the primary emotion. Resolving this will reduce the secondary emotion of anger. 
You may find help in doing so by reading books on anger and or the inner child or abandonment. In all cases, however, anger is a choice. There's always a split second before anger begins to express. A momentary gap between the trigger and the reaction during which time we can choose differently and or remove ourselves from the triggering situation. Thanks in large part to the landmark work of Dr. Hans Selly at the University of Montreal over 60 years ago, the effect of stressful emotions on our health is well documented today and widely understood. Selly's work demonstrated that emotional strain and what he called unpleasant stress play a very significant role in the development of all types of disease, including high blood pressure, ulcers, and some type of mental disorders. Conversely, Selfie also found that pleasant stress contributes to our well-being. At the Institute of Heart Math, they even refer to positive emotions as assets and negative emotions as deficits to the vital energy that keeps our bodies operating harmoniously and sustain us on a daily basis. Are you clear on why negative emotions have such a wide impact on our lives? Psychotherapist and author Dr. Wayne Dyer put it like this. He said that they corrode our connection to our source. I always like this analogy because in one way or another, the negative emotions and thoughts act as filters or blocks to the flow of infinite intelligence and power into our world of affairs. Even worse, as we have talked about earlier, they are actually attractors of negative experiences. About this time, you might be wondering if you have to do a complete makeover of yourself in order to see your miracle unfold or your reality created. Not at all. You're listening to this because you want a shortcut to your miracle. You want to know the secret to creating your reality. The shortcut is knowing what to do, but it also includes knowing that what can hinder or delay your miracle. Powerful negative thoughts, feelings, and emotions work against the unfoldment of miracles and your chosen creation of reality. You are the only one who can determine whether or not any of the material in this episode applies to you. If it does, you'll recognize it and get a new perspective on how to handle these powerful feelings. Even when you're able to make only small changes in releasing these negatives, you will establish new patterns in thinking, and the patterns of your thinking are the key. These patterns have a cumulative effect that profoundly impact all areas of your life. Simply by understanding this and by forming the intention to shift your thinking, you begin the process. By becoming increasingly focused on your intention, you can make small changes and then larger changes and then larger still. Finally, one day, some months later, you will realize that you have made substantial transformative changes in your thinking. At the same time, you will realize that you are leading a happier, more fulfilled life and the things in your life seem to be working in harmony together. This is the atmosphere in which miracles take place. In most cases, which we experience guilt, regret, or resentment, we think that the way we feel is the right way to feel, and we're very certain that anybody else in the same circumstances would feel the same way. Usually, we think it's the only way to feel and that we really can't change it. Worse yet, the more we think about it, the more we justify our position and the more susceptible we become to similar pain. No matter how long these negative thoughts and feelings and emotions have been around, no matter how strong they are, and no matter how well-founded we may feel they are, this is the important principle that applies. They are negative patterns of thinking, and we can change them. The fact is this, the incident does not create the negative emotion. When you have something and you assume it works to your advantage, even if it's bad, you change the emotion. 
We create it ourselves by placing guilt or blame either on ourselves or on someone else. When we examine such incidents from a different perspective, we can usually find a better way to think, one that allows us to be free of the physical and emotional tightness and tension that accompanies these negatives. When we're able to do this, this allows us to open more fully to our reality, even if our negative thought pattern might seem to be totally unrelated to the miracle that we're looking to achieve. These negatives are the root cause of some of our key challenges. As we learn to think differently, we open the door to a fuller, richer, more rewarding life, but possibly of even greater importance for you at this moment. It may even open the door to your miracle. Imagine that the creative power and intelligence of spirit are the sunshine outside your window on a bright, clear day. Then think of guilt and resentment as emotions that are like the Venetian blinds on your window. The more powerful your negative emotions, the tighter the blinds and the darker the room. As you release the negative emotions, however, the blinds open and sunlight streams into your room. In like manner, the creative action of spirit is always present and ready to flow into expression in our world. We open to it, we limit it, we filter it, or we block it all through our thinking. In fact, in many cases, when we release these powerful negative emotions, the change alone may be all it takes to allow our miracle to appear. The release changes everything. We feel better, our thinking clears, our relationships are more harmonious, and in many cases, our miracle makes its appearance, our reality is created. For some people, just reading about a new way to look at things will be enough to help them make big changes in their thinking. For others, it might spark the desire for additional internal work. It is your thinking, and you can change it. Changing your thinking involves making a shift from one type of habitual thinking to another. We all know that habits, both good and bad, become virtually automatic. We do and think habitual things without having to exert much effort. The downside to this, of course, is that when we want to change our habits and or our habitual thinking, we go through an unsettling period where we have to focus very carefully and painstakingly on what we're doing in order to make the changes. This is why a lot of people struggle with this because they don't want to look at those negative emotions. But this becomes easier and easier as we go along. And the day comes when we're able to look back and see that enormous strides were made. Along with that comes a feeling of inner well-being that is the soil in which our miracles take root and flower. The first and probably most essential step to manifesting your reality that you want to reaching your miracle is to become willing to let go of negatives such as guilt, regret, and resentment. Yes, to become willing. This is the doorway to the change we're looking for. By becoming willing, we signal to the universe our intention that we want to let go of the things that have been holding us back. Sometimes that's hard. I had a hard time letting go of things, and really the most important step for me was to become willing to let them go. When this happens, we're led to the right people to help us, the right books to read, and the right videos to watch, the right things to do to move us further along on our journey. The release of these powerful negative emotions transforms them from obstacles into stepping stones on the path to a higher consciousness. This is the pathway, not only to the creation of your reality, to the manifestation of your desire that you want right now, but to other desires in your future as well. There are three transformational stepping stones. Each of them can either be a major obstacle to miracles or a major stepping stone to a greater miracle-making consciousness. These are letting go of the past, handling guilt, handling resentment. In all of these cases, the key is to forgive. Forgiveness is the answer. Let's discuss this further. Trying to move forward in life while holding on to the past 
is like running a race while looking backward. Whenever we hold on to the past, we do so by choice, and generally because we believe it was so good it can never be replaced or so bad it is causing all of our current problems. Although neither of these is essentially true, both become true to the extent that we believe them to be true. There's nothing wrong with remembering wonderful times of our past. The problem comes when we continue to live there. We probably all know people in their 40s and 50s who regularly exhaust their friends with detailed accounts of their college football exploits or references to when they were class president or when they almost were class president. I'm reminded of the brother of a good friend whose fiance had broken their engagement a month before their wedding. That happened when he was 25 and when I last knew him, he was almost 50 years old, still living at home and refusing to consider new relationships because he was convinced that nothing could compare with the one he had lost. He is begging me all the time ways to manifest a specific person when in reality he could just simply let it go and move on. Anytime we stay in the past, we are there by choice. Neville Goddard talks about this with revision. And if the past is bothering us, go back and imagine it differently. That is one way for you to let it go as you'll start to see changes because the way you hold on to the past is limiting the reality that you can create. If we tell ourselves that the wonderful times of the past cannot ever be duplicated in our lives, well, that's probably what's going to happen. Another way of looking at the same circumstances, however, is to know that wonderful times of the past can prepare us for even more wonderful times right now, as well as wonderful times in the future. There is absolutely no limit on the wonderful times And there's absolutely no limit on wonderful people. Other times, we hold on to the past because we think we have no choice. We tell ourselves and others, well, if this has been your experience, you wouldn't be able to let it go either. Again, this is not true. I have talked to people that are stuck in their past and they tell me, I'm sorry, Brian, you're wrong. There's no way you can let this go. But as we have discussed previously, We live in a universe that responds to our belief. And so it becomes true to the extent that we believe it is true. In many more cases, people hold on to the past, not because it was so good, but because it was so bad. For example, a bad childhood can be a continuing excuse for many people in handling the problems they have as adults. I am this way because of the way I was treated as a child. Say that over and over again a hundred times and eventually you start believing it and then you can't escape that. A bad marriage can be a continuing excuse for the problems of many other people and a bad experience at their last job provides grist for the mill for a host of other individuals. As long as these people continue to relive their bad experiences and when people relive their bad experiences, they're revising their past to what it was. Because how do you know the past even happened. You awoke this morning in your body. How do you not know that your consciousness was placed into your body with the memories that you have? How do you really know? As long as people continue to relive their bad experiences, they will find themselves handling continuing problems for which they can blame their father, their mother, their ex-spouse, former boss, Simply put, if their problems were due to their bad childhood, then everybody who had an equally bad childhood would experience the same kinds of problems. If their problems were due to a bad marriage, then everybody who had an equally bad marriage would experience continuing problems. And if their problems were due to a bad experience, then all the people with a bad job experience would have continuing problems. But that doesn't happen. And the reason is that many people choose to stop blaming their problems on what happened to them when they were children or what happened to them in their first marriage or what happened to them at their last job. They learn to let go of their victim stories. There is a story about two Buddhist monks who were making a three-day journey from one monastery to another. Early on the first morning of their journey, they came to a rather wide but shallow river. On the shore was a very lovely young lady 
who was attempting to get to the other side. Her skirts were long and full, however, and she feared she would lose her balance and fall. The younger of the two monks smiled, engaged her in brief conversation, and offered to carry her across. She gratefully accepted, so he picked her up and carried her to the other shore. There he set her down. She thanked him. They all wished each other well and continued their journeys. That night, as they were preparing for sleep, the older monk chided the younger one, Brother, you committed a sin this morning when you carried that young woman across the river. You were not supposed to touch her. The younger monk sat still for a moment and then responded, Yes, my brother, I did carry her across the river, but I put her down on the other side. You have carried her with you all day. You begin to see that when you live in the past, you simply compound the pain, reinforce the vividness of the memories, and sacrifice today and tomorrow in the service of yesterday. You also make it much more difficult, or in some cases even impossible, for the miracle to unfold, for that thing that you want to manifest. And you do have a choice. Feelings of guilt are often excruciatingly painful and make us feel awful about ourselves. Because they are so painful, we tend to push them down and out of our conscious minds as quickly as possible. But we don't let them go. They still remain in our subconscious. Dr. Gerald Jampolsky, well-known psychiatrist and author of Goodbye to Guilt, defines guilt as the feeling of self-condemnation that we experience after we do something that we think is wrong. Whether or not we actually did something wrong is not important. For example, a friend of mine carried enormous buried guilt because she had been told at age six that her naughty behavior had caused her mother's death. You and I can see how abusive and unfair this was to this little girl, but nevertheless, my friend still had to work through her feelings of guilt as an adult. Later on, she also had to release her resentment toward the aunt who had told her this. In another situation, a man I know carried great guilt because when his company failed, all his employees lost their jobs and their incomes. While it was appropriate for him to feel empathy for the changes in their lives and to assist them, if possible, They were all responsible people with talents and abilities capable of relocating to other good positions. I had to remind him that he had provided wonderful employment and incomes for many people for many years. Every step along the way, he had done the very best he knew how. Now it was time for him to address his own needs. So whatever the cause of our guilt, we need to recognize it and confront it before we can release our feelings of guilt. Most guilt relates to something we have done or not done. We condemn ourselves for whatever it was and carry that feeling around inside like a big boulder. It weighs us down. It makes us feel beaten down. It destroys our confidence and our self-esteem. Dr. Japonsky also found that whenever we experience feelings of guilt, we also anticipate punishment. Think about it for a moment. Is that really what you want while you're waiting expectantly to manifest your reality? I don't think so. There are two simple approaches to handling guilt. Don't be misled by their simplicity. Both are effective. Use one or the other. Repeat them often if necessary. Once you clearly affirm your intention to release your feelings of guilt, the universe responds. Don't shove your feelings down. Don't Push them down into your subconscious. Work through them, face them, and release them. For the first approach, literally hundreds of thousands of people in 12-step programs have freed themselves from bondage of guilt and moved forward into wonderful new lives by following steps very similar to this process. First of all, recognize and identify what it is you feel guilty about. In addition to just thinking about it, write down and spell out in detail Everything you think you have done that is so terrible. As you do this, you may come to realize that it really wasn't such a big deal after all. Guilt can sometimes cause the same kind of vague, fearful anxiety that a bad dream has. Writing it down is like turning on the lights and getting rid of the monsters. Two, acknowledge your part in whatever happened that may have hurt someone else. Try to look back on the situation as objectively and compassionately as possible. Do this without beating up on yourself and without blaming anyone else. And third, if if there's something you can do to correct the problem or make amends, then do it. 
Maybe there's a heartfelt apology to be made or a sincere letter of apology to be written. If the person involved is no longer available, i.e. They, they've died or moved away, write the letter anyway and then burn it. But write the letter with all sincerity. And then finally, four, release the guilty feeling. I don't need this anymore. And commit to take only the lesson forward with you from now on. You've recognized it, acknowledged it, and made whatever amends are possible. From this point on, resolve to think of the situation only as a learning experience. There's nothing more that you can do. It's done. It's complete. It's over. Let it go. For some reason, we are less forgiving of ourselves than we ever would be of someone else in similar circumstances. We also set the bar much higher for ourselves than we would for others. Here's another technique that has proven to be very helpful in such situations. Take two chairs and place them facing each other a few feet apart. Sit down in one chair and imagine that a counselor or trusted friend is sitting in the other. Now tell the imaginary counselor all about what you've done that is causing your guilty feeling. Say as much as you possibly can. Talk about what happened and why it happened. Tell the counselor how you felt then and how you feel now. And now move over to the other chair and be the counselor. Respond to what you have just heard. You'll find that there is a part of you that has an amazing compassion and understanding for what took place. Continue the dialogue moving back and forth to each chair as necessary. Talk back and forth to the imaginary you about whatever it is that they have done and try to help them feel better. Almost invariably, you will see things from a completely different perspective. You will feel compassion and understanding totally unlike what you may have been feeling towards yourself. For example, you may see that this is what kids sometimes do, or it wasn't that terrible, or you did this because at that time you didn't know how to set boundaries, but now you do. Just trust me, try it. You probably will be able to see the entire situation more objectively. You may also see how hard you've been on yourself. If you re-envision this dialogue whenever feelings of guilt about the situation start to re-emerge, one or more of three things will happen. First of all, the guilty feeling will begin to dissipate. Secondly, you will intuitively become aware of insights that will cause you to see the situation in a more objective light. Or third, something will come to mind as to some corrective action that needs to be taken, and subsequently, the taking of that corrective action will release the guilty feelings. The answer to handling guilt is self-forgiveness. And this does not take place when we stuff it down. I'm not saying that doing it just once is going to fix everything. These steps may need to be taken again and again until all your guilt is finally gone. But every time you do them, an important part of the work is being done. Think of a sculptor working with a piece of marble. Every tap of his hammer and chisel is necessary to complete the job. And may it require a lot of taps. Do we know how many taps of the hammer Michelangelo had to make before he achieved his David? Resentment occurs when we believe we have been wronged or insulted in some way. Someone has done something to us that has wounded us. The injury may be real or it may be imagined. It may be something recent or it may be from a long time ago. It may be something that happened to us or it may be something that happened to someone important to us. It all makes no difference as the effect is the same. Resentment is usually characterized by a long-standing, powerful, negative feeling that simmers just below the surface. But it does surface, and regularly it surfaces when we are reminded of it, and it surfaces in quiet moments when nothing else is taking our attention. In fact, the word resentment is derived from the French re-meaning again, and sentir meaning feel. That's what we do. We feel it again and again. It is resent and resent. Unlike feelings of guilt, which we tend to push down and out of our minds as quickly as possible, we tend to clutch onto feelings of resentment in our consciousness, as though reliving our indignation or outrage is something going to make things better. We often entertain ourselves with imaginary revenge or one upmanship. One of the most successful attorneys I know uses affirmative prayer to release any and all feelings of resentment. 
anywhere present in the preparation of all of his cases. When going into court, he visualizes the entire courtroom filling with the love energy that balances and harmonizes every word and action. There is a jury. He surrounds the jury, in particular with thoughts of love and appreciation. Here are some things to consider about resentment. Resentment is the emotional reliving of something unpleasant that happened to us in the past. The more we relive the resentment, the more we keep it going in living color and manifesting in the future. This keeps us glued to the past. By continuing to focus on the feeling of resentment, we not only are filling our minds and bodies with negatives, but we also laying the groundwork for more negative experiences. Even if we somehow even the score, the victory is always hollow and the resentment continues. Nothing we can do will change the past. What we can do is to change our perception of what happened. Maybe the most important point is this. Where there is resentment, there is blame. When we blame, we have made ourselves a victim. As we have already discussed, we are not, or at least we don't need to be victims. When we see ourselves as victims, that's the way the universe responds to us. But when we see ourselves as victors, as heroes, as heroines, that too is the way the universe responds to us. Regardless of whatever may have happened in the past, the truth is this. You do not need to be a victim. When you're in control of your thoughts, you're in control of your life. To be a victor, you must see yourself as a victor, not a victim. Many years ago, a friend of mine was a senior vice president at one of the largest public relations firms in the world. He had been there for 20 years and fully expected to work there for the rest of his life. And then one day, completely without warning, his boss called him into the office. One of the agency's large clients had filed for bankruptcy and they owed the agency a lot of money. This money included many man hours the agency had expended, as well as substantial monies advanced on behalf of the client. So the agency was out of pocket well into six figures. Bob was the supervisor on the account. It didn't matter that Bob had actually become concerned about the client's financial solvency some months earlier and had taken his concerns to the accounting department, advising them to monitor the account carefully. It didn't matter that he had processed all the out-of-pocket costs immediately, and yet the billing had been tied up for many weeks in the accounting department. It also didn't matter that the accounting department was shorthanded and running behind in all its work. All that mattered was that the agency was now on the hook for a lot of money. Within a few minutes, he found himself out of a job just like that after 21 years. He had about half an hour to, before the close of the day to clean out all of his personal possessions and leave. For years before this, he had fantasized that if for any reason he left this large agency, he would like to go into business for himself doing the same thing. So after he had packed up all his personal things and he walked through the doors of the agency, for the last time, he said to himself, now I'm in business for myself. And some while later, after the shock wore off, he realized that if he had left his job by choice, his profit-sharing account would have been fully vested because he had been fired. However, he had been divested of certain agency contributions, interest, monies known as remainders and such, and it came to a lot of money. In talking with his lawyer about the papers to form his own agency, he asked about his profit-sharing money. After some investigation, his lawyer told him that his opinion, the circumstances of his firing qualified as a wrongful termination. That would mean that he was legally entitled to all the money he had received had he resigned plus damages. The lawyer was so confident of his legal position that he offered to file the necessary lawsuit on a contingency basis. In other words, he would not charge a fee, but instead would take a percentage of the final award. And that sounded pretty good to him. And so the lawsuit was filed. He formed his new company and it was exciting for him. He was filled with energy and enthusiasm for all he was handling, except for when he had to talk to his lawyer about the lawsuit against this agency. One night, he set up late thinking this lawsuit was taking a lot of time and negative energy. He loved the meetings that took place with his lawyer when working on aspects of his business, but he really disliked the meetings with his lawyer when they went over the materials for the lawsuit. He became aware of that after those meetings, he would remain filled with anger and resentment toward his old company. Also that his muscles would feel heavy and his mind sluggish rather than focusing on the business at hand. He would find himself thinking for long periods of time about the wrong that he felt had been done to him. 
He loved the experience of building his new company, and he knew now more than ever he needed a clear creative mind and the vital energetic drive he normally experienced. There's a couple of hundred thousand dollars involved in that lawsuit, but he realized his whole future was involved in his new company. He put the two things on a scale, and he made an important decision. Even though there was no cash outlay required on his part in terms of the lawsuit, he decided the emotional cost and energy drain was too great. He decided that he was far better off putting his time and energy into his business. Six months later, after reflecting on his decision, every one of his key clients had followed him to his new business. He congratulated himself on having made the right decision, the decision to let go of his resentment instead dedicate his time and energy to his new undertaking. Now, he was making more money than he had ever before, and he was happier than he had ever been at the other agency. Sometimes the right decision is hard to make, but it's easy to live with. Forgiveness is the answer. Every one of us has had things happen in our past where we felt we were wronged by someone else. We may have been lied to. We may have been betrayed. Someone may have taken something that belonged to us. Someone may have harmed us physically or emotionally or both. Someone may have broken a promise or let us down in some other important way. Or one of these things may have happened to somebody we love, somebody we feel responsible for. Or we may have done something that caused pain or loss to someone else. It may have been something we did unwittingly, something we did intentionally, or possibly a situation where we simply should have known better. Whatever it was, for carrying the burden of guilt or resentment, we are expending huge amounts of powerful emotional energy that keep us from moving into the world of miracles and manifestation. The power of these emotions is like a crazy glue in terms of keeping us attached to parts of our lives that caused us pain. In all too many cases, we continue to relive that pain, sometimes occasionally, sometimes often, because we do not know what to do about it. Forgiveness allows us to move out of the past and not bring the painful emotions with us. Since we magnify and increase that to which we give our attention, our painful experiences are certainly not what we want to recreate in our worlds. Many people believe that in order to forgive, we have to act and maybe we're even supposed to feel as though what happened to us was okay. Others think we're supposed to pretend it never happened. None of this is correct. It did happen, but the simple fact is that as long as we continue to carry and nurture these hurts, the pain of yesterday continues to destroy the beauty of today. When I had two kids come into my house to rob my house and shoot me, I could have just held that as a resentment forever and lived in the pain and resentment of it forever. Of course what they did was wrong. Of course I wasn't just supposed to act like everything was okay. But as long as I dwelled on that negative emotion, it would never have gotten better. The Stanford University Forgiveness Project is one of the largest and most important studies ever conducted on forgiveness. Its co-founder and director is Dr. Fred Luskin, a pioneer in the field of forgiveness training. Part of the early work of this project dealt with both Catholics and Protestants from Northern Ireland who had lost family members during the many years of fighting and violence. In this project, Luskin demonstrated conclusively that even people with the most devastating of personal losses can learn to forgive, and when they do, they feel better physically and psychologically. Following a one-week forgiveness training program, participants in this project reported less stress, hurt, depression, and anger. The hurt they were experiencing when they began the training moved from an 8 or more to less than 4 by the end of the week, on a scale of 1 to 10. Further, their depression was reduced by 40% during this same period. Follow-up measurements taken four and a half months later continued to show the same positive results. Imagine people who experienced such personal devastation were able to begin to let go of the pain they had been experiencing sometimes for years. Surely, if these people can learn to heal the pain of their losses, so can most of us. In fact, these early participants returned to their homeland of Ireland, committing to teaching others how to forgive. In The book Forgive for Good, A Proven Prescription for Health and Happiness, 
Luskin discusses his groundbreaking work and the techniques he used in his forgiveness training programs. He says that there's a simple three-step process that takes place whenever we form a grievance that is interfering with our life. We, first of all, take it uh, an offense to personally. We blame the other person for how we feel and we create a grievance story. By taking an offense too personally, he is not in any way diminishing the importance of the event. In my case, somebody shot at me. The bullet bounced off my back. They were stealing stuff from my house. Obviously, I'm taking that personally. What he is talking about is the simple fact that nothing that happens to us is unique. In other words, there is virtually nothing that we experience that has not been experienced in some way or at some time by a number of other people. Knowing that our experience is shared helps release some of the pain. For some reason, this simple recognition can aid enormously in allowing us to acknowledge the pain without staying stuck in it. He also makes the point, holding people accountable for their actions is not the same as blaming them for how we feel. We are the ones who are responsible for how we feel. The upside of this, of course, is that when we are responsible for something, we can change it. A grievance story, of course, is the story of the painful experience from which we have not healed. As we tell the story, we re-experience the anger or the pain, and we very well may find ourselves telling our story at every opportunity. People have learned to forgive in many ways, but first and foremost, all of these people begin with the intention to let go of the pain that they were carrying from the experience. One man told me that when he was a kid in school, he was betrayed by his best friend. The resentment he experienced was emotionally overwhelming and even resulted in stomach pains. I finally recognized, he said, that I was paying the price all over again every time I thought about it. And I decided that the price was too high. After that, any time the incident came to mind, he visualized himself strong-arming it away. He would also say to himself, I will not let you or the incident hurt me again. He found that it worked, and he has used that technique throughout his life, or for other situations as well. He decided at an early age that life was too short for resentments. At the other end of the spectrum, a woman told me that it was through her experience as a member of a 12-step group that she was able to heal from living for years filled with pain and anger due to the emotional abuse she experienced when she was a child. She said when she first tried to become willing to forgive, she couldn't do it. So she worked to become willing to become willing. Finally, after working on this and listening to the stories of other 12-steppers, she finally became willing to become willing, and from that there was enabled to become willing. Finally, she was able to move to forgiveness. Today, many years later, she is a center of balance and harmony for a stormy and rather dysfunctional family that is slowly but surely learning from her example. Someone else described how they felt unjustly squeezed out of a job and they couldn't let go of this feeling of rage over the injustice. When they had chest pains that resulted in angioplasty and the insertion of a stent in one of their arteries, they took responsibility for what they had allowed to happen to their body. That was 20 years ago. Today they are strong and healthy and successful in business. When I last spoke to them, they said the price of not forgiving is just too great. Luskin's research also has demonstrated that when we learn to forgive, we also learn to limit the degree to which we are hurt in the future. Forgiveness is the answer, the answer to letting go of resentment, as well as letting go of hurts from the past. And self-forgiveness is the answer to letting go of guilt. Forgiveness is the simple act of letting go of the painful past so we can move forward. It is allowing ourselves to open to the richness and beauty of today rather than the pain of yesterday. It is deciding not to be a victim and letting go of the victim story. It is recognizing that what happened days, weeks, months, or decades ago is less important than what is happening today and tomorrow. It is releasing this pent-up energy of the past. It is opening to the song of our true self. It is making way for a greater love in our lives at every level. It is opening to a greater flow of infinite intelligence, divine power, and unconditional love by our own means. It is making way 
for the miracle that you want, for the manifestation that you desire, for the reality that you are intending to create. So to summarize, work to develop and maintain a strong attitude. Your miracle is possible. Your manifestation is never too big. You play a major role. You deserve the best of everything that you want in your life. You need to let go of complaining and blaming and self-criticism, criticism of others, the coulda, shoulda, woulda. Be very clear on what you want. Expect the very best. Open your mind to all possibilities and place no blame. Let go of your resentments. Make sure your attitude is positive. Love what you do. Enjoy it. You deserve the very best. Love yourself. Appreciate yourself. Let go of the past if that's what's holding you back. All the obstacles that you have faced are stepping stones to something greater. When you overcome these obstacles, then everything will change. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.